Take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading. 1 Samuel chapter 3, please. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. We are going to verses 11 through 21. Verses 11 through 21. We read the verses responsibly. We'll begin together on 11. I'll read 12 together on 13, alternating like that until we end together on verse 21 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Ready? And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. And Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every wit, and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Lord, thank you so much already for what we've heard, the wonderful songs and music today, the fellowship. Lord, the giving of the tithe and offering. It's been good to be in church this morning. And Lord, we're asking you now that you would prepare our hearts and continue to Make us ready to receive the truth from your word today. We want our hearts to be good ground, that, that fertile soil that the word of God can fall into and it will bring forth fruit in our lives. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you'll bless the special to that end and tune our heart with your heart this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The gulf that separated me from Christ my Lord Was so vast the crossing I could never ford From where I was to where he is It seemed so far I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. He came to me. He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. When he could not 
come to where he was. He came to me. The gold came to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to his side. Where today in his sweet love I now abide. He came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died. On Calvary, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. Now, right. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and ask for your help as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you today for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word and preserving it for us that we hold copies in our hand today. And Lord, we desire that you speak to us this morning. Thank you already for the music and what we've heard. And I pray now that you would open our eyes that we could be old wondrous things out of your law today. Help us to focus. Help us to concentrate. Lord, don't allow our mind to wonder and miss what you have for us today. So, Lord, please help all of us to give our attention and our uh, respect to the only book you've ever written. And may you use it in our hearts and lives today. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And if you give me just a little bit more today, Dean. I've been fighting some allergies, and I know my voice isn't quite as strong as what it should be. God is uh, speaking here to Samuel. Most of you are familiar with this story from maybe being in Sunday school as the Hannah has prayed for a son and the son that God gives her, she names Samuel because Samuel means ask of God. And she asked of God for a son and God answered that. It gave her Samuel. She keeps him at home until she, he's weaned and then he, she brings him to the temple and gives him to Eli. And Samuel now is just a young boy. Uh, uh, probably, I'm thinking at this stage of his life, uh, seven or eight years of age. And uh, the story goes, he's uh, laying at night sleeping, and he hears a voice saying, Samuel, Samuel. And of course, you know the story, he gets up and runs to Eli. And I says, hey, you, you called me. And Eli says, I didn't call you. Uh, go back to bed. He goes back and lays down, and hears the voice again. He runs to Eli again. Eli says, I didn't call you. And then he sends him back. And this happened a third time, and finally Eli, uh, the light comes on, and he says, I think God's talking to you. Now, I'll tell you why that was hard for Eli to understand in a minute. But he tells him, you go lay back down, and this time you just tell God, speak uh, for your servant hears. Your servant's listening. And then God tells Samuel, this boy, what he's going to do to Eli and to his house. And, and, and I won't go into all the details, but it's not good news. It's judgment. It's, it, there's no sacrifice, there's no offering, only judgment. And Samuel gets this. In the morning, Eli comes to Samuel and he says, What did God say to you? Tell me. What is it that God said to you? Now that's interesting. Who knows who Eli was? What position did he hold? Yeah, he was the high priest. The, the, the priest in the, in the Old Testament was the one who went to God on behalf of the people. He was the messenger from God to the people and the people to God. Isn't it odd that the one who's supposed to be communicating with God is asking this eight-year-old boy, what did God say? That's kind of the opposite of the way it's supposed to be. The people are supposed to be coming to Eli and saying, you tell us what God said. 
He was supposed to get the message from God and bring it to the people, and instead, he's asking the people what the message from God is. That sounds eerily like today, doesn't it? But here's, here's, here's the message this morning. Eli was not on speaking terms with God. Eli was not on speaking terms with God. You know, you boil it down, that's really what church is, is about. You know what the job of the pastor is? The job of the pastor is to get a message from God and then bring it to the people. That's the job of the pastor. That's why when the apostles in the early church, when they wanted them to uh, take care of widows, they said it's not right for us to leave the Word of God to serve tables. It's not that they couldn't serve tables. It's that, 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 that then you're going to suffer by not getting a message from God. I'm to, as soon as, can I, can I let you a little bit into, into my life? As soon as Sunday evening's over, my first thought is, God, what do I preach next Sunday? What is it that people need next Sunday? That's the first thought that comes to my mind. That's the first prayer I pray on Sunday night. Is, what is it? Right away, it's already, God, I need a message for next week. What is it that, that people need to hear next week? From the Word of God. One thing, that's why whenever you come, what you got to hear is you got to hear God's Word. You got to get a message from the Word of God. This is what God has. This is what God has for us. Eli has no message. Eli has no power with God. Eli has no breath of God on his life. But the one thing I do like about Eli is he did want to know what God said. And, and by the way, you ought to want to know what God says. You ought to want to hear what God says. And that's why, listen, if you, if you have a place or you find a place where there's a man of God who will take the Word of God and preach the Word of God to you and give you a message from God every single week, man, I'd drive to hear that guy preach. I'd want to listen to the man of God. It doesn't matter if it was 10 miles or 20 miles or 50 miles. Having a choir is nice. The choir did a wonderful job today. Having special music is nice. I like the way they put the rose among the thorns in that special group this morning. And um, some of you get that later. But uh, they, I, I like having the nice music. And, and, and it's nice that you have a, a children's program or a nice building. That's just fine. But listen, uh, the question you ought to ask, is there a man of God there? Is there someone there who will get a hold of God and get the message from God and bring the message from God to us uh, on a weekly basis and in the, the preaching of God's Word. What does God say? No, no greater punishment, really, could Eli have than to have no fellowship with God. Can you imagine to have nothing, to hear nothing from the Lord when that's your job? That's what he was supposed to be doing? You know, man was created to fellowship with God. When, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, God eventually came down to the garden in person. What did He come down to the garden to do? Yeah, He came down to walk with them. He came down walking. Walking is simply this. Walking is taking repeated steps in the same direction. I'm taking a walk. Okay? So if I'm going to walk with God, I take repeated steps in the same direction as God. And that's walking with God. And that's what God... That's what God created them for. When they sinned against God, what they lost was the ability to walk with Him. They couldn't fellowship with God anymore. That was sin had come between them and God. And, and therefore, there's no communication. They hid from God. They couldn't do what they were created to do. God didn't save you just so you wouldn't die and go to hell. I'm, I'm thankful that's part of the deal. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. And most people, that's why they come to know Christ, is because they realize that they're sinners, and as sinners, we deserve to pay for our sin. And, and God says the wages of sin is death, and that death is separation from Him. And, and, and all you have to do to die and be punished in hell for your sin is don't do, don't do anything. You just have to do nothing. There's a, we have gospel pamphlets down here that open up on how to know you're going to heaven, you know, and they take you down the Roman road and 
I understand you're a sinner and there's a price to pay for sin and that Jesus paid the price for you and if you put your faith in Him as your Savior, you can have eternal life. Uh, years ago, a fellow made a track and it said, what must I do to go to hell? And when you open it up, it was just blank. You know why? Because you don't have to do anything. You just keep doing the way... You don't, you, if you do nothing, you're condemned already because you haven't believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so the good news is, you don't have to die and go to hell. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and He died on the cross for you and for me. He took your place. God commended His love toward us. Are you listening? In that while Christ was, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you and me. Jesus was the Son of God. Being the Son of God, He never committed any sins. And if He never committed any sins, He wouldn't have to pay the wages of sin. But He hung there on that cross and He bled and He died. Not for His sins. He didn't have any. He's dying for our sins. But by the way, He was dying for your sins and for my sins. He took every sin that I've ever committed and He laid those sins on Himself and He said, God punished me instead of staying slave on. But He took every sin that you've ever committed and He laid those sins on Himself and He said, God punished me in place of put your name there. He died for you. Guess what? Three days later, God brought Him back from the dead. The resurrection. And God was saying, I'm accepting my Son's payment for the sin of mankind. And that's what God says we have to do. We have to, by faith, accept what Jesus has done for us. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is a gift. It's a gift. But when I get a gift, I realize that I get a gift because somebody else paid for it. Alright? The, the, somebody who just had a birthday. Brother Bowman had a birthday. Yesterday, was it? Yesterday was your birthday. I saw him a picture with a cake. I saw a picture where you probably got presents. Did you get any presents? You did. He got a tie on. He's wearing his present. All right. When, when, he, when he opens that gift up and he sees the tie, okay, he doesn't say, okay, how much was it? Oh. And that's probably what people would do. They laugh at him. You know, I say, put your wallet away. It's a gift. It's already been paid for. God said eternal life is his gift to us. And people say, Okay, God, do I gotta go to church? Do I gotta keep the commandments? Do I have to get baptized? God says, put your works away. Put your works away. It's all paid for. There's nothing you can do to receive my gift. You just have to receive my gift. It's already been paid for. Well, wait a minute. Brother Bowman knows that whoever gave him that tie, who gave you the tie? Okay. Ivan and his wife figured out, let's see, what's he need? They probably looked at Brother Bowman and said, he needs some ties. And, um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and they decided to go shopping and they, they, they got in the car and went through the traffic and found a place to park and went into the store and they found a nice tie and said, this one will look good on him. And they went and checked out and paid for it. And then, Ivan, you're saying your wife did all that. You didn't have anything to do with it. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but it, no, okay. And, uh, and, and then they drove home. They box it up and they give it to him. Happy birthday to you. And he opened it up and he received it. By the way, he didn't pay for it. Who paid for his tie? Ivan and his, somebody who cared about him and loved him and wanted him to have a gift. Well, who paid for your eternal life? Yeah, Jesus did. Someone who loves you, cares about you, and wants you to have eternal life. It's nothing you do. It's what Jesus has already done for you. And you accept his gift of eternal life. That's why the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus, shall be saved. You receive Christ. You receive God's gift of eternal life. You say, is it that easy? Aren't you glad it's easy? Huh? How hard is it to accept the gift? Was it real hard to accept that tie by the moment? No, not at all. No, you get it. We, we all get accepting gifts. 
And it's 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 a it's a it's a easiest thing you ever done in your life. You accept what Jesus has done for you, and you receive the gift of eternal life. But listen, God does that and gives us the gift of eternal life, and we won't have to suffer eternity in hell. But that's not the main reason He saves us. He saves us so we can fellowship with Him. Do you understand? Eli was a priest. The only way that if 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 I was the high priest in the Old Testament. Okay? And, and you were the people. You couldn't talk to God. I talked to God. You couldn't approach God. I talked to God. There was a place in the temple, or the tabernacle, either one, and it had a veil. There was a big, thick curtain, 8 to 12 inches thick. And I, the high priest could go through that, through that veil one time a year into the presence of God. And I would go with a blood sacrifice, with blood, and I would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat as an atonement for your sins and for mine. And you'd be forgiven for your sins for a year until next year I'd go in again. If you tried to go through that curtain into the Holy of Holies, you know what happened to you? Yeah, you'd be struck dead. Just like that. You didn't go in the presence of God. When Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, you know what happened to that veil that was inside the temple? Yeah, it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. You know what that means? That means we can all come in now. There's no curtain there. We can all come into the presence of God. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Now, now Hebrews says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly into the presence of God. That's, now we can all have a relationship with God. We can all talk to Him. That's what God wants. That's what God desires. And Eli couldn't do that. What caused... Hey, listen. Here's the message. What caused his fellowship to cease? What caused Eli to say, I don't have... I'm not hearing from God. Number one, he failed to train his boys properly. Notice with me, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, you okay? All right, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Verse number 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan, or kettle, or cauldron, or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. I won't go into all the details of this, but basically they were helping themselves to the offerings that were coming in. And they were taking their portion and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, grab in and whatever comes out is mine, whatever's left in there will be God's. Okay? It's like the, 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 the ministers who were talking about how they keep their, how they uh, take the offering and how they keep, the, decide what they get paid out of the offering. And by the way, I don't get paid out of the offering. Okay, don't worry about that. But here the guy said, one preacher said, well, I go into my office on Monday morning and I take the collection from Sunday. And he said, and I put it, I draw a circle on the floor and I stand in the circle and I throw the money up in the air. So whatever comes down inside the circle, I keep. And whatever's outside the circle goes to God. And the other minister said, well, I kind of do the same thing. But whatever falls outside the circle is mine. Whatever falls inside the circle is God. Third minister said, well, I do the same thing. But I just throw it up in the air. And whatever God wants to keep, he keeps. And whatever comes down is mine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been Eli's boys. That would have been what they were doing. And here's the tragedy. Here's the tragedy. Look down further. Verse 22. Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. 
how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle congregation. And he said unto them, Why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Verse 29. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He said, I'm young parents, I want to help you. You're, you're headed for some lonely and heart-wrenching years if you don't train your children. Amen. If you don't train them the way God says you ought to train them. Eli, one of the reasons that he did not hear from God was he failed to train his sons. He failed to train his children. Don't honor your children more than you honor God. Don't put them in the ball game on Sunday and miss church. Don't do that. You're honoring your children more than you're honoring God. Say, oh, they'll be mad at me. They'll thank you later. They'll thank you later. And you'll be glad later when they're still in church and not at the ball game on Sunday. But mom and dad, be, be careful. Don't put your job ahead of the Lord either. Don't put the TV ahead of the Lord either. Don't put the NFL ahead of the Lord either. You can put other things ahead of God that, that, that are teaching your children. Uh, listen, uh, oftentimes, mom and dad, it's not just what you're saying, it's what you're doing that they catch. It's caught as much as it's taught. Training is teaching, but training is more than teaching. Training is, is, is doing... When you, when you train something, when you train even a dog or... Uh, you can't train a cat. Cats train their owners. But you, you train a dog, you know, you, you over and over and over. Re repetitive behavior. When you're training at a job, you're going to do something over and over and over again to where you know what you're doing. Training is over and over and over. How many times you say, you look at your kid and said, how many times have I told you that? Well, you've got to say it quite a few more times. Okay? Because your mom and dad had to say it quite a few times to you. Okay? And, and you know, it just, it's just over and over again to train them up in the way they should go. Can I help you with something? Don't, don't criticize the authorities in your children's life. Don't criticize their pastor. Don't criticize their youth leader. Don't criticize their teachers. Don't do that. You know something? Superiority never criticizes inferiority. Did you catch that? Superiority never criticizes inferiority. Someone, someone who criticizes or has the juicy gossip on somebody, that's them being inferior trying to pull themselves up by pushing down someone else who's superior. You know, here's the amazing thing. You ever think about this? Knowing, knowing what you know about Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, wicked men, not right with God. And by the way, remember, uh, Eli said, it's what I hear. This was pretty common knowledge. What, what, kind of faith, what kind of faith do you think it took for Hannah and Elkanah to, to, to bring their boy Samuel and say, Here, Eli, here's our son. Ever think about that? They left him there with Eli. Huh, that guy, he can't rear his own sons. He's not going to have any influence on mine. 
We had a family one time who uh, wouldn't uh, decided not to come to church. They didn't like the person we had teaching the teens at that time. It wasn't you, Xavier. <laughs> and they didn't like him because, well, his kids didn't turn out right. I don't want him talking to my kids. Wow. You know, can I tell you something? Eli did a good job with Samuel. Eli pointed him in the right direction. Eli did help. You know, just because you didn't do a good job with your kids doesn't mean you won't do one with somebody else's kids. Don't write somebody off. Don't write them off. They may help your kids. And they may know what's right. He didn't, didn't rear his very well, but he did rear Samuel very well. The second thing I want to leave you this morning is, Eli, the reason that he was not on speaking terms with God was he had not done what God told him to do. He had not done what God had told him to do. Let me ask you a question. Why would God tell you more to do when you haven't done what He's told you to do already? When you disobey and you do not tithe or you don't read your Bible or you don't pray and you're not faithful to church and you expect to hear the voice of God? Boy, that's quiet. You come Sunday morning, but there's other things to do on Sunday evening. And God says, no, you ought to forsake not the assembling yourselves together. You ought to be faithful to the house of God. Well, yeah, Lord, I know, I know that, but tell me, tell me what else I should do. Even if you're a good parent, you don't handle your own children that way. If you tell your child to clean the room up before you do anything else and they come out and say, hey, I'm going to go outside now or I'm going to go you know, uh, play my video game now or whatever it is, you're going you're gonna to say, first thing you're going to say is, is your room clean? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm, I'm getting to that. That's important to me, but I'm going to do this first. Parent, you don't accept that. But we think that's okay with God. Well, yeah, Lord, I know, I know, I know I shouldn't do that, but I, Lord, give, give me something else to do. I'm going to get to that, Lord, you know, baby steps. But give me something else to do. Don't bow your head, it's not time to pray. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? You know, in the, do you remember in the, reading in the New Testament, the parable of the pounds? The, and, and I believe it's the same in the talents. Uh, two, one was given two, one was given five, one was given one. And in both cases, the fella, the, the ones who got five made five more, got ten, two, got two more, got four. The one got one, went out and buried it. And when the Lord came back, they unburied that talent. And do you remember what the Lord said to do with that? He said, give it to the guy who has ten. I'm sure there were people there who said, that's not fair. <laughs> He's got ten already. Hmm? Now maybe they wouldn't. They, weren't, they aren't Americans maybe. But, uh, huh? No, you know, what, what is the Lord saying? I'm going to give it to somebody who's obeying what I told him to do. This guy's not obeying. I'm not giving him any more. In fact, I'm taking away what he has and giving it to somebody who will do what I tell him to do. Do you realize when you don't obey God? When I don't obey God, I cut off His voice. I won't be on speaking terms with God. Sometimes people say, now, Pastor, you say all my sins were forgiven at Calvary. And they were. Let me ask you a question. Just your past sins? No. In fact, when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, how many of your sins were past? No, you weren't even born yet. You hadn't even been thought about yet. All your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross. You weren't even here yet, neither was I. But He died for all your sins. Past, present, and future. So people say, well then, why do I have to ask forgiveness of my sins? So you can restore fellowship with God. Your sin blocks the fellowship with God. And you can't. It, your sin's iniquity separate you from God. You see, you have to walk in the light as 
he is in the light to have fellowship one with another. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, that cleanses us from all sin. It's the fellowship. Are you doing what God's told you to do? Since you've been saved, have you been baptized? That's just obeying the first command that God tells you to do. Are you serving? Are you witnessing? Are you reading your Bible? Are you, are you studying your Bible? Are you memorizing your Bible? Are you meditating in it? Are you asking, uh, uh, are, you, are you doing, are you telling others of Christ? Or are you disobedient and what you spend your time doing is asking everybody else what God said? Samuel, Samuel, what did God say? Samuel could have said, you're the high priest, you tell me. He didn't. But listen to me. Do you rely on everybody else to tell you what God's saying? Are you on speaking terms with God? We all face trials. We all carry burdens. Everybody's going to have heartaches. If you're not on speaking terms with God, you're not going to make it. You won't make it. Unless you get on your alone, alone and in your, on your face before God and ask God to help you and speak to you, you'll falter, my friend. You won't make it. Samuel. Samuel. What did, what did God tell you? What did, did God talk to you? What did He say? Are you on speaking terms with God? You ever seen a TV show called Hoarders? I can tell you must have. You know, it's kind of sad. They, they say there's like three million hoarders in the United States. These are people that their homes are, are full. I mean, capital F, capital U, capital L, capital L. Where, how many of you have seen that show? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. You, 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 I mean, usually there's a path, you know, just, just about that, that wide that you walk through and there's just mounds of stuff. I mean, stuff all around. I, I, I saw one, a 73-year-old woman who they uncovered four tricycles in her living room. What's a 73-year-old need with four tricycles? <laughs> I don't know. But there they were. You can't see the counters. You can't see the, the, the kitchen table. You can't use the bathroom. It's too packed with, with junk. It's just crazy. But you know what's interesting? They'll put a microphone in these people. And you know what they say? They say, you know what? I was, going to get, I was going to get to this. I was, I was going to do something about this. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I'm glad these people came and they're going to help me out and get rid of some of this stuff, but I was going to get to it. And of course, you know, their family and other people who have intervened have been hearing that for years. But they're ready to lose their home, their kids, their health. And you watch that and you think, man, what, what's it take? But, but wait a minute, let's, let's bring it around to us. What's, what's it going to take for you to take action in your life? You look at them and say, man, what, what would it take? Did it take intervention here? Did it take them losing their health? Did it take somebody dying? Or what, what did it take to get them to call in help and get help with their issue of hoarding? Well, what's it going to take to get you to deal with your issue to be on speaking terms with God? What's it going to take? Is it going to take you losing your health? Is it going to take the doctor saying you have cancer? Is it going to be a family issue or a relationship problem? Losing your job? Interesting story when 
You remember when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and the plagues were happening? Do you remember that one of the plagues was frogs? Frogs were everywhere. I don't know about you. I mean, they said you, you, you'd go to put something in the oven and frogs are in the oven. Bed. Pull back the bed covers. Frogs sitting in your bed. Can you imagine? Everywhere you go, frogs. And the amazing thing is, Pharaoh finally called Moses and said, Man, okay. Man, Moses said, You want me to get rid of the frogs? Pharaoh said, Yes, get rid of the frogs. Moses says, When do you want me to do it? And Pharaoh said, Tomorrow. There's a famous preacher. He had a sermon called One More Night with the Frogs. Huh? Can you imagine? Why? But that's no different than God coming to some of you and saying, when are you going to stop this? When are you going to start this? When are you going to begin this? And you say, Lord, tomorrow. Can I help you? If you tomorrow or sometime or I'm going to, that is not the language of the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God doesn't say tomorrow. The word that the Holy Spirit uses is today. The word the Holy Spirit uses is now. Some of you this morning, God has spoken to your heart and you feel the touch of God in your life and you feel like, hey, it's missions conference. I believe God wants me to be a missionary. I think I ought to surrender my life to go wherever He wants me to go to do whatever He wants me to do. And, and somebody says, well, hey, you need to let the, the church know. And you need to let people know. Make that, oh, I'm not now. Can I help you? That's not the Holy Spirit telling you not now. The Holy Spirit says now is the accepted time. You're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. You have no idea if you died, you go to heaven. You had no idea anybody could know that for sure. And you hear today that eternal life is a gift that I could receive it because of what Jesus has done for me. Huh? And there's, there's that voice that come to you and say, yeah, that's good, but you don't need to do it right now. I think Satan's favorite tactic is not to tell you the Bible's not true, salvation's not true, that preacher, he's not telling you what's right. No, I think he tells you, no, he's telling you the truth, he's telling you right, you have to accept Jesus, you just don't have to do it now. I believe hell is populated with many, many millions of people who fully intended to get saved. They knew about Jesus, they knew about eternal life, they knew they needed to call on Him, they just didn't want to do it. Not today. Not today. You've seen them. I've seen them. You've seen them come forward on big days and they make profession of faith and we talked about them getting baptized and how many of them say, well, I'll come next week and get baptized. Remember that? Or I'll come back tonight and get baptized. I'll guarantee you in the 35 years people have said that I can count on one hand the number of people that have come back and done that. The devil's favorite thing is to say, not now. Oh, that's why the Bible says today. Now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. You know, listen, if you know you're a sinner and you know that you should pay for your sin and you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that if you'll call on Him and ask Him to be your Savior, He'll save you and give you eternal life, why would you not accept that gift? Today. Now is the time. And if... God is pointing out things in your life as to why you're not on speaking terms with Him. Why wouldn't you take care of that today? Why wouldn't you clear that out of the way today and say, God, I want to be on speaking terms with You. I want to hear from You. Charles Spurgeon was a famous preacher from the 1800s. He said this, and we'll close with this statement. Charles Spurgeon said, I want to live my life in such a way that when I lay my head on my pillow at night and I look up to God and I say, I love you, God. He can look down from heaven at me and say, I know it, Charles. I know it. I don't know about you, but that's how I want to live. Are you on speaking terms with God?
Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Lord, thank you for the truth here in 1 Samuel. And Lord, we realized this morning that we want to be on speaking terms with you. We, we're not going to make it trying to do it on our own. Unable to talk to you, unable to get your help, unable to reach you because of our own disobedience. And so God help us. I pray for those in the room this morning that have never received your gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That today would be the day they would receive your gift. Receive Jesus as their Savior. I pray that today would be the day that some in this room would bow the knee and say, Okay, God, I'm not going to be like those hoarders and always say, Yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to begin this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm doing it today, God. Today's the day. Work in my life. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying here in just a moment. And we'll have our invitation. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder how many folks in the room this morning could say, Pastor, you talked about receiving that gift of eternal life and receiving Jesus as your Savior. There's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed to be saved. And I knew Jesus was the Savior I needed. And I called on Him and from my heart I trusted Him as my Savior. And Pastor, I know that I'm saved. I know that I have eternal life. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Say, Pastor, that's me. I know that I'm saved. Okay, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven. In fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. But Pastor, I, I appreciate if you'd pray for me, and I'd like to just pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. I'll just remember you in prayer. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Join these. Say, Pastor, pray for me today. I'm not sure. Now the message is to believers today. Are you on speaking terms with God? Did, God? did God put His finger on some things in your life today that need to get straightened out for you to be on speaking terms with Him? I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, the, the Spirit of God pointed some things out this morning that I need to take care of today. I want to be on speaking terms with God. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. If God has spoken to your heart today, if you never received Christ as your Savior, after I pray, we're going to stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Bob will sing. Christians will come to pray at the altar. Slip from your seat. Come down here to the front. We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Don't put it off. Do it today. If God has spoken to your heart this morning and you believe God's calling you to be a missionary, to be a pastor, to serve Him in some way, then you respond and come. Make that decision public today. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day can bring forth. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for hands that have been uplifted. I'm praying, God, now that you'll help each individual to do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. Help those who have never received Christ as their Savior to come and say, show me from the Bible how I can know I'm on my way to heaven. And Lord, I pray that they'd walk out the doors in a few minutes saying, I know I have eternal life. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. Lord, help those who came in the door this morning not on speaking terms with you to leave today on speaking terms with God. Have your way, please, in this invitation, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you? 
yeah, that's Lord, right. Have thine own way. That's right. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way. Have thine own way, search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Have thine own way. Have thine own way, wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, O oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way. Have thine own way, hold o'er my being, absolute sway, fill with thy spirit, till all shall see, Christ only always living in me. Got a name we're going to read for you here in just a minute. Thank you. We're glad to have Stephen Phillips coming this morning. Stephen lives here in Grove City. And uh, yesterday, Brother Yoder and Scotty were out uh, just knocking on doors, giving out the gospel, and they came across Stephen. And Stephen prayed and asked Christ to be his Savior yesterday. Yeah. And so making his profession of faith in Christ this morning, we're sure glad about that, Stephen. Praise the Lord. Thanks for coming this morning, and thanks most of all, your important decision of receiving Christ as your Savior. That's great. And uh, we'll give you some material that will help you uh, in your Christian life and be talking to you about getting baptized, okay? God bless you, Stephen. That's great. Wonderful. Amen. Appreciate the faithful folks who go out every Saturday morning. And uh, Brother Yoder's a good soul winner. And uh, be part of that crowd on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Be good to have you out and go make some visits on Saturday morning. Uh, they're out there. Just got to go get them. That God never told them to come. He did command us to go. And uh, we got to fill that command. Amen. All right, ushers, are you ready? We want to take the offering for the flood victims there that we'll send to the Central Baptist Church down there. You got it? The There we go. If you make a check out, just make it out to Bible Baptist Church, and then we will send a check down to them uh, to use for the, for the hurricane relief, okay? All right. 
Just come on, fellas, when you're ready. Father, again, we pray your blessing on our giving now. We pray again that you'll bless this church as they minister to the community. May this come in as a help and a blessing, Lord. And I pray that not only can folks get physical comfort from the offerings we give, but, Lord, they also will receive eternal life. And we'll meet some of these folks in heaven one day. Bless the offering to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray for the Burns family. Uh, Jeff's brother Rick passed away. Uh, his, you know, her, his parents came up to see him. And uh, was it Friday night, Saturday morning? Early this morning, Saturday morning. So pray for Jeff. Pray for the family. Pray for mom and dad. Uh, just you know, come up and get their lives right with God, and and then have to deal with this. But uh, God knows. God knows, but pray for him, will you, and encourage him, and uh, good to see you here this morning, Sue. Thanks for being here, Kim, and uh, pray for the family, okay? Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, and Father, thank you for desiring to not just save us, but to be on speaking terms with us, that you desire to walk with us and fellowship with us, that you desire that we draw nigh to you, and you'll draw nigh to us. So, Lord, help us to walk with you. Help us to talk with you. And Lord, help us to have the relationship with you that you desire. Give us a good afternoon. Prepare us for the services this evening, Lord, and help us to be back in our place tonight. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's sing it together. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood joined us with Jesus as we travel this sun for I'm a part of the family the family of God Amen, you're in a special seat tonight